Hey art nerds! I have another watercolor illustration for you guys today. Today we're painting something inspired by cinnamon tea. So the cinnamon tea we have here has some sugar in it. Um, it they're just in regular old tea packets. And while I really enjoy it, I was hoping for like a really spicy cinnamon tea that was more like eating Red Hots. But the cinnamon tea we have is a very comforting kind of cinnamon tea and it's great to drink after a stream when my voice is kind of strained. So I wanted to kind of celebrate cinnamon tea and how comforting and how warm it can be in today's illustration. So this is one of the <laughs> probable 7 inch Kara volume 2 postcard. So this would be one of the winter postcards. Uh, I've already done designs for rose hip tea and a uh, apple cider. So I guess I have multiple winter illustrations, at least two. I'm not really a winter person myself. I know some folks are. Uh, growing up in Southeast Louisiana, our winters, as I've probably told you guys like a million times, are more brown and dreary than winter wonderlands. Living in Nashville, winter is cold, that is for sure, but I tended to get iced in more than we tended to get snowed in. So uh, I don't have any like really idyllic winter experiences to share with you guys. So my perception of winter is probably a little bit different from other people's perception of winter. But that doesn't mean I don't like a nice warm drink when the weather gets cold. Something to warm you from the inside out. Although personally, if we're talking about winter drinks to warm you, I'm a big hot cocoa kind of gal. And as I get older, definitely a hot mocha kind of gal. I guess that makes sense. I did marry a cocoa after all. So I must, must be something there. So um, this is in the Canton XL watercolor sketchbook. It's the same watercolor sketchbook I've been using for all of these tea illustrations. And it was sketched with a Pilot Color Eno pink lead that allows us to give it kind of this lineless look. And I really wanted to, well, for the tea, I really wanted to try to capture the crystal clear clarity of the cinnamon tea where it's like this really warm, rich, dark brown, but it's perfectly see-through. And I wasn't quite as successful as I would have liked to have been, but I will say I gave it a good try and I'm pretty satisfied with the end results. And if you guys would like to see all of the finished pieces, I've been sharing them over on my Instagram. And I've also been sharing bits and pieces of the process through my stories and on my Instagram feed as well. In fact, my Instagram is a great way to get a sneak peek at what Whatever I'm working on. You can check that out at instagram.com slash natosoup and I'll have a link down in the description below as well as a link to all the materials used in this illustration. So for the foliage I wanted to do the holly and the ivy. Um, it's a traditional winter hymn, winter song I guess. Uh, I feel like we all know snatches of it, but we don't really know the whole song. And I do know it came about in the Middle Ages, so it's quite an old song. And uh, ivy is used in areas where you might not get evergreens or deciduous plants. So um, I guess in England, they used a lot of ivy. It's not really one of the plants that we in the U.S. think of when we think of Christmas foliage. But uh, I definitely wanted to create a wintry illustration that has it since here in Louisiana it doesn't necessarily get cold enough for things to dry anyway or die that much anyway so it's not like we're really hurting for winter foliage. So I wanted to differentiate the ivy from the holly by using different color palettes. So the ivy is more blue based and cool greens and the holly is warmer, more sap green. So for the ivy, I used a base of undersea mixed with appetite green, both of which are by Daniel Smith. And for the ivy, I used a cool Sennelier yellow, it might be alien. And I also used Magello's Marine Blue. For the cinnamon tea, I used a mix of Holbein's Imadolzarine. I might be saying that wrong. I'd have to double check against the tube, but I'll have it linked down in the description below. Uh, they're that red and a little bit of burnt sienna and a little bit of Venetian red. 
So in most of these watercolor chats, I pick a couple of colors that are like the hero colors of this illustration. And there's a fair amount of colors in here, so it's kind of difficult for me to pick a particular favorite. I will say I love Magello's Marine Blue. It's a really wonderful thalo blue that's a little bit darker than your average thalo blue and you get some wonderful shading out of it. And it's a color that's in my daily driver palette and I use it quite frequently, but it's not one I talk about all that often. I really like Magello watercolors. I reviewed them a long time ago, but I have difficulty finding them open stock in the US. So my daily driver palette doesn't really reflect how much I like Magello watercolors. If you guys know anyone I'm sure Jackson's art sells them open stock and you can buy the sets on Amazon but really when I'm doing the majority of my watercolor paint shopping it's at a physical art supply store and I'm like oh that color looks interesting I want to try it so the other color for today I'm so tempted I really want to say Irma Dolzarine red uh, I but but what's keeping me from doing that is I know I am getting the name wrong and I would hate to like sing my praises for a color and the name's totally wrong. I can only imagine how much my comments would blow up from that. So while I really like that color, it's going to have to get another video where I talk about it because I just can't in good faith talk about it here. So instead, I'll talk about Winsor & Newton's Alizarin Crimson. And I've liked Alizarin Crimson for a while and different brands Alizarin Crimsons look a bit different. Like Grumbacher Academy's Alizarin Crimson is more of like a flesh kind of color. So it's wonderful for blush and for cheeks. And uh, Winsor & Newton's Alizarin Crimson is a cooler color and it's the color you see on Kara's dress, but I've also used it on her cheeks and her lips. And it's just a really nice sort of primary mixing watercolor. So uh, generally when we're talking about color theory and watercolor, if you get all the way back to basics, we're talking about the basic six color palette of a cool red, a warm red, a cool yellow, a warm yellow, a cool blue, and a warm blue. And a lizarding crimson is a wonderful option for your cool reds. Magen uh, Quinn Magenta is also a good option that can add a little bit more pop, but Alizarin Crimson is one of the standard ones. Now, true Alizarin Crimson, I have heard, is fugitive or somewhat fugitive, so that's why you can also get permanent Alizarin Crimson. And it's just a little bit different, not too different though, from regular Alizarin Crimson. So many sort of pre-packaged paint palette sets will come with a lizard and crimson or a permanent a lizard and crimson or whatever that brand's close approximation is like Windsor Red would be very similar to a lizard and crimson. So even if you've never seen it, you've certainly, or rather, even if you've never heard of it, you've certainly seen it in some of the palettes. It's a wonderful base color for mixing. That's why it's often included in those limited colors, six six paint sets and uh, it mixes fairly cleanly. It does granulate a little bit, but it's not over granulating. So you're not going to get a lot of uh, sedimentation and you're not going to get a lot of muddiness like you would with other colors that granulate, but aren't necessarily geared towards mixing. And I think that's actually what I like about Magello's Marine Blue as well. A lot of the qualities that make uh, Alizarin Crimson a good mixing color are qualities that make Marine Blue a good mixing color as well. Hmm. I do like granulating colors, sedimenting colors. I mean, you guys heard me sing praises for undersea green. It's just that when it comes to color mixing, for me, I really prefer to stick with more transparent and translucent colors for mixing because I feel like I get cleaner mixes like that. So for the ivy, I wanted to create some that were more in the shadow, more in the background, and then some that were more in the foreground. And I used a little bit of color theory for that. I used yellow to bring our foreground leaves to the front, and I used a wash of the marine blue to push our background leaves a little bit further into the back. 
So for all of these T illustrations, I'm handling them a little bit differently than how I would handle, say, a 7-inch Kira pages. They are much lighter, they're not as rendered, and I focus more on using local color and saturation to build up our shadows and to build up our forms. This makes for a much faster watercolor illustration and one that's fairly well suited to the cellulose paper that we're using here. Now to just kind of make the illustration look like it's actually on the paper, I use a little bit of ultramarine deep, Sennelier's ultramarine deep, to kind of place it on the paper. And if I haven't sung odes to ultramarine deep yet, I know that's coming up in another video because it's definitely a workhorse color. I often use it as my color that I use to shade whites. So I'm the sort of artist who really likes to create sets of things and I like to work along themes. I mean, obviously I would do monthly inking October challenges or rather month long inking October challenges every year, usually around something Lilliputian based. So clearly I like themed sets of things. And these tea illustrations have been a lot of fun in the same way. I mean, there is, I will admit, a repetitive element to it. I, I'm not, I'm not in, mm, naive to that, but that's one of the things that's also really appealing about sets of things is that you have these repetitive elements, but then you also have elements that change. And the repetitive elements allow you to focus more on the elements that are not so static. And maybe that's what's so appealing is finding ways to twist and change the theme so that it's still the same theme and it's recognizable as the same theme, but each image could stand alone and all the images work together. Hmm, that seems like a very comic artist sort of thing to say since comics are sequential panels that work together to tell a story, although many of them are not designed to stand alone. In fact, having your comic panels, having all of them act like they would be single illustrations is actually often detrimental to comic art. But it's fun to think about and it's fun to think about in theory and to consider as something more practical to try out in the real world. So this illustration ended up taking me longer than some of the other illustrations. So it's a bit more time lapsed. I crunched it a couple more times just to get it down to the limit. But once I started inking it, it moved a lot faster. I'm not really sure why it took me so long. Um, I think it's because the paint was not really drying that evening. It was a really rainy evening. And even though we have a dehumidifier and it was running at full tilt, you can only keep up with hurricane season so much. So to ink this piece, I am using, as you guys have heard several times before now, I'm using the Tombow Furunosuke brush pen. So these are colored brush pens and they 
Wow, can I talk? Sorry. Sakura uh, Pigma FB. Do you guys ever get the problem where your brain is moving faster than your mouth and so your mouth starts to trip on itself? That happens to me all the time. So when I stumble on words, it's because my brain's already two paragraphs along and my mouth's just trying to keep up. Anyway, I'm a big fan of brush pens. I find them easier to ink with than technical pens. I like how portable they are. I like how clean they are. And gee, I wish brush pen companies recognized that comic artists and illustrators really like their products and marketed to us too. Especially with the Tombow Funonoskes. If you watch the other tea videos, you guys know where I'm coming from with this. You've heard me talk about it before. So I'm not going to go into it too much. But please, 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 Tombow, add more colors to your range. I was on the Dick Blick site last night and neons are great. But give us some pastels. Give us some muted colors. It would be so useful. And I'm sure the calligraphers that are your, you're marketing to here in the U.S. would appreciate those colors as well. So speaking of desperately wanting some shadow color brush pens, I ended up using the black Sakura Pigma for a lot of this because there are so many darker colors and the Fudenosuke range is a little too saturated and a little bit too primary to be particularly useful in this instance. I really love how inking kind of ties these pieces together. It gives it some structure, some backbone, and a little bit of extra contrast. And it can kind of bring some intentionally sloppy painting uh, kind of into focus. That's one of the great things I think about making art is when you get to the point where you're, it's starting to get a little bit chaotic and then you can reel it in with either like some white gouache highlights or some careful inking or by drawing on top of it. There's just something, it's like magic. It's transformative to be able to do that. So now that it's all inked up, all we have left to do is add a little bit of white gouache here and there. And I feel like adding white gouache just adds a lot of liveliness, particularly to the eyes. It's like when the piece actually comes to life. And you know, I, I can't lie and say it's my favorite part because honestly, then I would be saying every part is my favorite part. I like the sketching. I like the painting. I like the inking. I like the gouache. They're all good. They're all fun. I think the only part I don't like is the scanning part. It is just mediocre. It's just scanning. You know, I'm not like, oh, I'm just so thrilled to be scanning. Um, but I'm also not like, oh, I hate scanning. It's the worst. But if there was a job I would hand off to an apprentice, it would be the scanning.
So I had a lot of fun painting this. I really enjoyed it. I'm not really a winter person, like I said, so you don't see a lot of winter illustrations from me, which means when winter comes along, I don't have a whole lot to share. I mean, a lot of that is growing up in an area that really doesn't get much colder than 30 degrees and is frequently in the 70s during winter. So I don't really, really know, or rather I had to learn what winter was all about when I lived in Nashville and I saw it and I didn't like it, so I moved back. So uh, you don't get a lot of winter illustrations from me, but it's nice to change things up and do things a little bit differently from time to time, you know, while still staying in your comfort zone. So I had a lot of fun painting this and I had a lot of fun chatting with you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed hanging out and painting with me. If you'd like to hang out and paint with me in real time on Saturday evenings, I do a power hour live stream here on YouTube. We do all kinds of fun stuff. You can check the community tab to see what's coming up this week. I usually have whatever that week's theme is announced on the community tab by then. And I'd love to get to know you guys. So swing in, drop by and stay hi. Wow, cannot talk. <laughs> Sorry. Swing by, drop in and say hi sometime. So I hope you guys found this video to be helpful, informative, and inspiring. And I hope to see you guys again really soon. Bye guys.